Well, good afternoon, Paul. Good afternoon. My name is Jan Hicks, and I'm an interviewer with the World War II Veteran History Project of the Augusta Richmond County Historical Society and the Library of Congress. I'm here on a gray November day, but a beautiful fall day, November 24th, 2009, with Paul Almendinger, who is a World War II veteran, and we are in his home, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for doing this. I think the record of this will be significantly important to my family. Maybe not to me, so much to me, but it will be to my family. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> uh, Paul, when were you born? I was born March 2nd, 1922. So, 87 good years and congratulations. Thank you. I feel pretty good for 87 years. <laughs> <laughs> Where were you born, Paul? Moline, Illinois. Would you describe your childhood as uh, country or town life? Small town, um, uh, interrupted by a bit because of my father's death when I was nine. But aside from that, it was pretty normal, I presume, and uh, significantly enjoyable as a normal childhood would be. And you grew up in Moline also? I stayed in Moline until through high school and uh, was there the whole time and enjoyed it. Early. Did you have siblings? I had a sister who was two years older than I am. Mm -hmm. When you were a little boy, Paul, uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? I don't think I really knew. Um, I prob my father ran a, owned and ran a business, a building materials and coal business, and I probably thought that I would probably move into that as the time came on. Of course, as it turned out, we, uh, with his death, we lost the business and everything else we had, but uh, from that point on, I really didn't know. And uh, so even as I approached uh, getting out of high school and making that decision, it was, still wasn't clear to me what field I might pursue. Mm -hmm. Law was one of them, but that's all. You said you went to high school in Moline? Yes. And you graduated when? I graduated in 1940. What were your plans after high school? Well, I went to, I uh, planned to go to college. That seemed to be no question about that, although in retrospect I'm not sure how I expected to pay for it, but be that as it may, I went to Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois, which essentially was uh, the town next to us, and was able to go there, and uh, of course living at home and doing it, it worked out fine. So I was there for one year at, at Augustana College. At which point? And uh, in the meantime, of course, was uh, applying for uh, admission to West Point, and uh, through my congressman and through what uh, friends I thought I had that might influence such a decision. But the uh, subsequently uh, the uh, decision came through, and I ended up with a second all in appointment to the Naval Academy, which had two problems with me. In the first place, I wasn't thinking of the Naval Academy. And secondly, the second all is not very good. Uh, as it turned out, the two people ahead of me uh, somehow disappeared from the picture. Somehow, I have no reason to know why. Uh, but then uh, they considered me, and I went in on primarily on my grades in high school and college, and uh, was in there directly uh, out of that first year in Augustana College. In June or July of that year, I was in the Naval Academy. When did you? come to the decision that you were even going to apply to a military academy? Oh, probably early high school. Uh, I had uh, a uh, some friends of my mother's, actually, uh, a gentleman from a family, that relationship was at West Point, and it had graduated from West Point, and I thought that was a, an excellent route to go for obvious and several reasons. Uh, that was the reason I applied for West Point. But uh, as it turned out, of course, uh, and that was the reason I applied and went after it. But uh, subsequently, uh, the Naval Academy showed up instead, and of course, in retrospect, I'm delighted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to hold that against you. <laughs> I still have to say go Army, beat Navy. <laughs> well, all right. We, we, we'll take that under we, advisement. We, we can just peacefully coexist, though, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> well, if you were... If you entered into the academy in '41, then you were a plebe in when Pearl Harbor was attacked. Yes, um, I was uh, uh, actually a plebe. I was actually in the hospital at the time. I had an infection in my ankle, and uh, was in the hospital for treatment of that. 
uh, in December of 41, and of course that's when the uh, Pearl Harbor occurred. And uh, but I was out of the hospital more or less directly after that, so uh, uh, continued to pursue my responsibilities as a midshipman, mm -hmm. and uh, it uh, it tightened up the security around the academy, but it didn't change our curriculum at all. Uh, generally, we pursued the same things we would have otherwise. Was there a lot of talk among your classmates imagining or, or speculating what this would mean? Well, uh, I'm not sure that I sensed that. I think what I sensed was that uh, there were enough indicators that uh, the world was at war whether we were or not, or not and that the aspect of Pearl Harbor, of course, got it into it very quickly. Uh, but it didn't seem to be out of order or anything uh, that we weren't, in a sense, prepared uh, psychologically or otherwise to, to address. So our routine, particularly at the Naval Academy, changed very little as a result of the Pearl Harbor thing. We did stand watches. We uh, carried a 45 and supposedly protected the security of the Academy, which was a little bit of a change. But aside from that, the, uh, the curriculum and the program continued pretty much as it was, except, of course, we ended up with a three-year program. Uh, so we graduated in three years, which was a significant change, but uh, that resulted primarily from reduction in summer cruises and other type activities that we couldn't do anyhow. So uh, the program during the war, during while well, I was there, uh, was pretty standard for that time at the Naval Academy. Mm -hmm. Had your father or grandfather, uncles, that kind of thing, uh, served in a military? My father was in the Army in World War I. Uh, he didn't go overseas, I don't know. He did not go overseas, but he was uh, in uniform and presumably would have if the war had continued. And uh, he was quite active in the American Legion. In fact, he was commander of the posts where we were and some of those things as far as the associated activities are concerned. Um, but I wouldn't think of him as a, a military man or a military career in any sense. What did your mom think when when you were a plebe at the Naval Academy and we had a nation going to war? I think she was delighted. <laughs> Not because we were going to war, but because I was at the Naval Academy. And getting a fine education, right, certainly. Right. Uh, I don't know. Um, it, it struck me uh, in retrospect that I come, somehow felt I was going to college. I'm not clear in my mind how I thought I was going to pay for it. But uh, once I got to Naval Academy, that was taken care of. So we were very happy about that. So technically, you were the class of 45, mm -hmm. but you graduated in 44. That's correct. And you graduated where, where, where all the graduates on a level playing field as far as the skills they had? Yes. Um, the uh, curricula at the Naval Academy, uh, everybody had the same courses, the same things, the same opportunities, the same restrictions perhaps. And uh, the only s process in, the, in graduating and going to directly into service was uh, an opportunity to select a preferred area of service. And uh, so that uh, would consist at the Naval Academy of being either a, a surface ship or a marine uh, in, in your initial pick. Um, submarines also were part of the selection process. Um, it, uh, you weren't assured that you would get what you asked for, but in most cases I think they did. But uh, I asked for a, a larger ship because my longer term interest was going into flying and in order to get back to fly, I felt they advised us that we should be on a larger ship so we could be separated at such a time as the opportunity developed. And uh, so I was on a heavy cruiser and uh, essentially asked for that kind of service. Did you have any special training for heavy cruiser? No, not any. I was no more prepared for a special for a cruiser than I was an aircraft carrier or a destroyer. And did you know you would be going to heavy cruisers before you graduated? I knew about the, actually just before I graduated, in other words, when the selections were made known. Mm 
and uh, our orders were presented to us, that's when we knew, but it was essentially when we graduated, when we knew where we were going. Before you joined a ship, you said that everybody went down to Jacksonville at one time or another during that summer. Yeah, the summer after we graduated from, from the Naval Academy, we all were assigned to a 30-day uh, assignment in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, the reason for it was so that we would be familiar with the Naval Air Program and uh, simply acquaintanceship with the, what they did and how they did it. Uh, so the class was divided into two groups, and uh, we went. Each of us went down for 30 days in in Jacksonville for that purpose. So after we graduated, we essentially either went went on leave for 30 days, or we went to Jacksonville. But it was a, an interesting experience because we were able to fly in most planes, and of course, were instructed as to what they did and how they did it, and it was quite revealing and enlightening, and certainly a pleasant experience after we graduated. Sounds like they might have been trying to entice you into naval air. Uh, that might have been a little bit of it. I uh, there seemed to be a lot of interest in the air anyhow. Uh, I don't know that they had uh, whether that enticement was necessary or not. But uh, uh, as it turned out, uh, a good portion of my, my class at the naval academy went into the uh, flight training program, and uh, so uh, when we got back to flight training, we were back home again with everybody we'd been for, for three years. So it was uh, uh, not only a, a desirable program of learning to fly and flying, which has always appealed to me, but also the opportunity to be with classmates and friends that we'd had for some time. So there was nothing you saw that made you think think twice? <laughs> no, not at all. It, <laughs> it, it went pretty much as we did. Um, and uh, our experience is... Uh, my experiences were all positive in, in all respects. I uh, was pleased and, and uh, certainly appreciative of the opportunities that that provided to me. Well, you, you finally did get a ship. Yes. And what ship did you get and where was she? I got the ship as a heavy cruiser and it was the Tuscaloosa. And it was a, built in 1937 and uh, it had a crew of about Roughly 1,200 people and maybe about, uh, oh, I don't know, six, seven hundred officers and and crew, and um, it was actually on. Gradu we graduated on June 6th uh, from the academy, and on June 6th the ship was at uh, D-Day in Normandy, uh, in the landings there, and uh, so I had to then. Uh, present myself uh, after graduating and after our experiences at uh, Jacksonville. Then I had to appear in Norfolk to catch my ship. But then I had to wait and be available on a 24-hour basis for uh, instructions as to where and how and who and so forth. As it turned out, I didn't catch the ship until October in Philadelphia. Um, when it came in and went into dry dock for refurbishing. but uh, So I had a couple months there of kind of waiting and wondering a bit. But it was uh, worked out fine. Had she sustained any damages, do you know, in the no. invasion? Or no. Just a normal re refurbishment? Right. So you joined her in October 44. Mm -hmm. And I guess the first thing you did was go uh, knock the butterflies out. Well, first uh, we had uh, about a month and a half in, the ship was in dry dock in the Philadelphia Navy Yard. So my first uh, association with the ship was a ship in dry dock. And uh, of course there wasn't, uh, they really didn't have accommodations for new ensigns either. So there were five new ensigns from my class that went into that ship, went on that ship. And I think we all slept in the passageway and <laughs> while it was in the uh, dry dock. Um, when uh, then when the, the uh, work and the refurbishing was completed, uh, then of course we went out and did some operations in the Atlantic, uh, what we call a shakedown uh, period in checking out the performance and the re revisions and repairs that had been provided. And uh, of course then went on to the Pacific from there. Mm -hmm. And you went down through the Panama Canal? We went through the Panama Canal, went up to San Diego. Um, and then from San Diego out to uh, Pearl Harbor, and then from there out to uh, 
Guam and on out to, uh, well, actually out to uh, Oga or, uh, Iwo Jima first. Mm -hmm. You said you spent Christmas on Hawaii. Yeah, we were in Christmas in Hawaii on the 44. And uh, the, nothing exciting, unusual, but uh, that's where we were. Was the crossing safe by then? Was relatively uh, <laughs> safe passage? Well, it was interesting to me because, of course, getting to Hawaii was no problem. It was pretty clear and open, and we were in control completely as a as a Navy, our Navy position at that time. But then in Pearl Harbor, and talking to some other fellows that had been at, coming back through the from the other way, they told us about some of their experiences, and uh, well, maybe this might be dangerous after all. Um, as it turned out, so we had some, I guess, some concern that way. But uh, uh, no, we had no incidents en route. We went all the way across the Pacific. Uh, we did, uh, from time to time, might have a uh, uh, an alert for a submarine or that sort of thing, but uh, not seriously. And so, uh, our first, uh, if you will, uh, uh, entree into battle was at Iwo Jima. And up to that point, we had uh, pretty pretty clear sailing. Uh, I guess the only thing that bothered us a little bit was uh, the captain worked us pretty hard. And uh, we weren't sure that he should work us that hard. But uh, other than that, why, uh, it, was, it was uneventful, perhaps. Well, speaking of work, you were a gunnery officer. Right. And you had other collateral duty. Well, I had... <laughs> My duties uh, actually in, in the operation of the ship was uh, primarily in CIC, which is the Command Information Center, uh, which is a controlling center as far as uh, strategies and gunnery and what you do and what you don't do. Um, the, uh, I stood opposite of the deck watches while on the ship, of course, as soon as I became qualified. And uh, beyond that, I had a... a uh, uh, general quarter station with a four quad 40 millimeter gun gun emplacement and uh, that was uh, about as small a gun as they had an officer on but other than that why well, uh, it was uh, worked out by so you uh, spent most of your time in the CIC and well, see, I say, yeah, and off to the deck watches. That's mm -hmm. and this was on the what bridge. we do as your normal operation. Gunnery uh, was there, but it wasn't didn't accommodate. It didn't require a lot of time, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, the ship uh, did well and and performed well, and uh, no relative problems. So it was. Uh, How did you take to, uh, to sea travel? No problem. Amazing. No problem. Um, some people, uh, some fellows got seasick. Uh, we had one, one officer that even the slightest jar, he became seasick. <laughs> and the other officers gave him a hard time. Oh, I'll bet. <laughs> but uh, generally speaking, it was not a problem. And, uh, Were there uh, chief petty officers who, like senior chiefs or master chiefs, who would take you under their wing and, and show you the ropes? Or is that done well, that way in the Navy? In a sense, not under the ropes in that context, but yes. In other words, the, the uh, CPOs were the ones that really, as far as I'm concerned, really ran the ship. And uh, presumably we were supervising and making sure they did it the way they're supposed to do it. Um, the duties that I had uh, did not uh, involve, if you will, guidance by a CPO somehow. Uh, it just depends, I guess, on what you were active in. Some places the uh, uh, the petty officer would be helped, uh, but it was more the assignments I had than it was anything else. And uh, so, it oh, was did you feel ready for these duties? Did you yes. feel you've been trained well enough? Yes, I felt completely comfortable, ready, and uh, didn't feel in any way inadequate to do whatever needed to be done. Well, at some point in time, you got the word that uh, Tuscaloosa was heading for Iwo Jima. Right. So were there special preparations made or? Well, no? um, the, uh, it was interesting to me particularly because uh, they asked me to update the plans that we had both for Iwo Jima and then subsequently Okinawa because the initial plans were continually being revised as we got closer to the dates when they actually were being executed. 
so there'd be minor changes in that and I was given the assignment to review the changes and insert the changes into the plan so in turn the plans would be current and ready and the reason that it was I thought very uh, interesting and rewarding and challenging or whatever was the fact that it gave me a chance to look at all the plans that were involved and it was uh, very impressive in my mind the degree of planning that was involved in going into Iwo Jima or Okinawa and I'm sure any other operation that would occur. So uh, it was quite impressive that way and of course that's the plans that we followed and that's what we did. And uh, the fact uh, that I had a chance to work on the plans themselves was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. So tell me about Iwo Jima. Well Iwo Jima was, we went in about a week before any, uh, there had been some aerial bombardment of the islands but uh, we were there the uh, first time that uh, the ships were in there for bom bombarding and softening up the uh, areas of landing and also some of the known uh, entrenchments that were there. So we were in there about a week before the actual landing and simply for a week just kept shooting and shooting and shooting. Now on a heavy cruiser we got 8 inch guns which are, are fair sized guns uh, and uh, so the use of the our large gun, larger guns were used to try and uh, break up whatever we could identify on the beach and uh, so that occurred, the landings occurred and uh, we supported that uh, at the time that it was done but uh, directly after that then it was a case of selective shooting where uh, we could be sure that we weren't firing in an area where our own forces were so it was uh, an attempt to be precise and productive as guided by the progress of our troops that were on the on the beach and uh, and we continued that for I don't recall the, the length of time but it was a month month and a half or maybe longer and uh, we were always available for that function so we were at Iwo Jima for quite a while. How much standoff distance did you have from the island? I well, let me ask this way. Yeah. Could you see the island? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, so no, you, you could see. You could even see uh, uh, people. I can recall uh, some of our rangefinders on the guns where some of the fellows that were watching could say they'd say somebody was walking up the path uh, with a basket of oranges on their shoulder type of thing. And uh, so try to miss that, you know, type of thing. Uh, so, no, you could see uh, with the, with the uh, optical rangefinders and that sort of thing, you could see significantly. With the naked eye, what could you see? Well, you could see quite a bit that way, too. You couldn't see all the detail. I'd say you might be, uh, I would guess you're probably uh, 10, 12,000 yards, something like that, mm -hmm. off the, off the uh, beach or off the island. I was just uh, watching a World War II special on uh, HBO, and they talked about the first flag that was, met, was raised by the Marines on Mount Suribachi was a very small flag, and then they subsequently came in and put up a, a very large flag. Did you happen to witness that when well, that we happened? didn't I was or see the flag? I wasn't conscious of the moment the flag went up, mm -hmm. but I saw the flag you know i I'd say within an hour or a few hours when it was up. We knew when Chiribachi theoretically was uh, uh, was controlled mm -hmm. and uh, so that flag was uh, very conscious to us. And uh, we were delighted, obviously, to see the progress that was being made. I imagine there was uh, quite a bit of hoot and hollering when you saw that go well, up. Well, yes, maybe not, yeah, I don't know. yeah, yeah. But uh, it, it didn't, it didn't reveal itself in uh, jumping up and down, screaming and shouting, particularly. I don't know why, but it just didn't seem to. But we were obviously very pleased at uh, the progress that was being made, and. Uh, of course, we were getting a little tired of sitting around the island there, so we, the sooner they could button it up, the better we could move on to someplace else. <laughs> Paul, did you get any feedback on your your uh, bombardment? How, oh. how would you know then? Aerial reports of what had been hit? Well, we had, of course, we had two, two ways. Through the, uh, uh, the Marines or the shore base systems could radio to us and ask for uh, a certain... Uh, Adjustment? location for firing and, and that sort of thing but we also had we had uh, planes on on our on a cruiser heavy cruiser you got airplanes 
and our planes would also be flying over and uh, spotting what we hit and what we didn't hit and that sort of thing. So we provide a bit of uh, evaluation, you know, right from our uh, from our own uh, resources. Mm -hmm. Were you off of the island the entire time, or did you go, I guess, let me ask this way, how long could you stay on a cruise without being able to go, without going in and getting uh, uh, reprovisioned? I Probably a lot longer than you think. I'd say 60 days. Um, uh, we weren't, I would guess, uh, I, I don't recall the timing exactly, but uh, I would say we were there for at least 30 or 40 days at the island, and uh, essentially, uh, more or less in the vicinity of the island and, and uh, environs of that. Um, uh, I, I'd say that I recall being at sea for close to 60 days before reprovisioning. Mm -hmm. And uh, Were you eating a lot of potatoes about 60 days? <laughs> well, you didn't, have much, you didn't have much fresh stuff, I'll tell you. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it didn't dawn on me till afterwards the fact that, uh, that uh, my mother always wanted me to eat salad, and I never liked to eat salad. Somehow that didn't appeal to me. After I was away from fresh stuff for 60 days, salads were tremendous all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you know, learn things as you go along, but uh, no, we, we, we ate well. Of course, we ate, we ate in the, we had the, you know, the officer's mess on the ship, so we had uh, uh, pretty nice combinations. And, oh, one, one thing I should mention that was uh, quite a, a feature was the fact that uh, when we came out of the Philadelphia Navy Yard, having slept in the hallways for about a month or more, uh, and we had had a uh, admiral that had been for a cruiser uh, over a cruiser division, and uh, but he'd been taken off the ship and put on some other assignments or something. So we had an admiral's cabin that was not being utilized. So they put five of us from the Naval Academy into the admiral's cabin. So uh, we we uh, we we lived pretty well. <laughs> you had said you went to Ulithi to do most of your provisions. Yes. Did you get ashore when you went there? Or? Well, you could see, if you want to call it that, there's a a little island there that's uh, I'm trying to remember it, uh, Wagwag or something like that uh, that we called it. And you, of course, they provided a lot of beer there and uh, uh, other booze. But uh, you'd get over there for an afternoon type of thing when you were in, in provisioning. And uh, some of them uh, had the opportunity to drink, and they drank. And that was the uh, first <laughs> chance to let, let their hair down, I guess is the word. But uh, uh, it, was, it was nice to get ashore that way, but it, the island was uh, you know, about the size of a postage stamp, so really wasn't any place to go there. <clears throat> At some point, Iwo Jima was winding down. Did you know where you were headed after that? Um, I think we did. Uh, I, think the, I think the orders were revealed to us about the time we were departing from Iwo Jima. Uh, because uh, Iwo Jima was uh, uh, in late January, early February type of thing. 45. Uh, and uh, we actually were on, on shooting positions at Okinawa on April 1st. So there wasn't a lot of time between them. So we pretty much, well, we went in for reprovisioning, but then went directly to to Okinawa and did essentially the same type of function at Okinawa that we'd done at, uh, at uh, Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm. But it's a much larger island, and so therefore it was a lot larger group of ships and other things that were involved in trying to uh, mm -hmm. uh, control that island. And uh, there was an awful lot of... Uh, uh, we were getting closer to Japan by that time, so we started encountering the kamikazes and some of the other uh, Japanese uh, response to our locations. This there. was as you were moving toward Okinawa? Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, while we are at Okinawa, in other words, uh, uh, on occasion we'd be, we'd move out from Okinawa to go into a disposition to defend ourselves against, uh, you know, maybe a hundred or two hundred kamikazes coming in. and. Uh, so it was, uh, now and then it was a little bit exciting in that sense, but um, we never, we thought we were going to run into what was left of the Japanese fleet, but we never did. We did run into a lot of the kamikaze air attacks on ships of our groups, 
but uh, we never, at least I didn't, encounter any of the service fleet from Japan at all. Paul, we are at the 30-minute mark, and Ten. so I'm going to flip the disc over. Okay. Paul, it's very interesting that at approximately the same time as Iwo Jima was being taken, the Battle of the Bulge was winding down in Europe. Did you get much news of what was happening in Europe? Very little, very little. We uh, had a, you know, a daily sheet of information on news uh, that uh, the ship put out for the crew and everybody. Uh, but it was superficial in the sense of uh, really uh, defining anything of, of any uh, understandable detail. Uh, so uh, things like the Battle of the Bulge, as far as I was concerned, uh, I learned about it more after the war than I did during the war. And uh, so uh, we, uh, we kind of stayed with our own Eyes forward, huh? Well, I guess our own <laughs> problems, maybe, and, and pursued those uh, and not, didn't worry too much about the other side of the, mm -hmm. the world. Paul, as you began to steam toward Okinawa and then got the closer you got, I imagine the threat was, uh, had increased. Were you at general quarters all the time, or how did no, that run? No, no. We, we, uh, we would obviously, if, if there was an attack of air attack from Japan, and we were fairly close to Japan when you get to Okinawa, uh, uh, then we would go and the ships would uh, move together into some type of a formation, a circular formation in most cases, but um, so that we could defend against such an attack. And uh, so uh, that would occur, you know, every few days maybe. Um, it was no feeling of uh, we're always under the gun type of thing, uh, so we didn't feel threatened in that way. Uh, we did have problems at Okinawa in their what we call the picket ships, which in most cases were destroyers, were at some of the extremities of the island, uh, both as pickets and trying to be sure that they were aware of what might be coming in submarines or otherwise, and uh, so the. The uh, attacks by the uh, Japanese planes many times went after those picket ships, and a number of them were attacked, and uh, some of them were badly damaged, and there were a lot of uh, fatalities involved with those, and that, that we were aware of, but it didn't threaten us as such. And uh, so that was always going on, but uh, then now and then there might be a major air attack, in which case all the ships would move and essentially steam off to a uh, disposition uh, able to defend against such an attack. And uh, it was interesting, and I'm not even sure this is intelligent, but uh, with as many ships as we had there, if you were sitting, we'd be at general quarters in those cases, and you could see the planes, and you could see the kamikazes, and you see them diving and all that sort of thing, but it went through my mind at the time with so many ships, and these would be hundreds of, of our ships I'm talking, and, and be destroyers and, and light cruisers, heavy cruisers, and, and uh, battleships and so forth, um, the, the percentages were with you in the sense that uh, if they were going to attack a ship, uh, you know, they might get you, but uh, likely they might get somebody else more likely. and so. It didn't seem like you were always under the gun, even in the attacks phase. We did have one experience with a kamikaze who was coming after our ship, and he actually was right, a, let's say, abreast of us coming in, and we got him. I don't know who got him or you know what, what got him, but we were hitting, him, shooting at him with everything we had, and he did uh, go down. But that was the only time there was a threat to us on the ship, as far as I was concerned. Would a heavy cruiser be a pretty lucrative target, by comparison to not, the other ships? Not anywhere near what a carrier or would be. Sure, the carriers would yeah. be the, 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 the big So they, uh, um, they'd go after the, the heavy cruiser, but they'd go after the carriers and the battleships, uh, uh, light carriers in many cases, and uh, before they'd go after a cruiser. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
that uh, so that we saw a lot of action, but uh, didn't have all that many times when we felt we were really under the gun. Mm -hmm. So fortunately, it was uh, not didn't seem that threatening. The operations at Okinawa, you said they were generally like what you had done at Iwo Jima, as far as the softening of the defenses the, through bombardment. Um, Very much so. Mm -hmm. Describe much so. what you did in Okinawa, if there was anything particularly different, for example. Um, no, but it, it went on longer because it was a, a larger island and a lot more uh, time was involved in, in uh, controlling Okinawa than we had at Iwo Jima. Um, and they were dug in pretty heavily. Um, and But the same general pattern of what we tried to do and what we were doing uh, was what we did at Okinawa just as much as we'd done at, at Iwo Jima. Uh, it was interesting at one stage, uh, I recall in the southern part of Okinawa, where the our forces were taking over the island and we could through our own optical uh, rangefinders and, and control systems we could see our troops coming down and we could see the Japanese troops being squeezed in between the shore and the attacking US forces it was kind of an interesting relationship at one point uh, it didn't affect what we were doing. We were kind of observing at that point, but it was an interesting situation to see. And uh, so our control was pretty good. Um, and uh, But uh, we did it pretty much the same thing. And, uh, you were off of Okinawa for the whole, in, until she until the island was yes, here? Yes, yes, yes. We were there until, we were there from April, May, June. I don't remember the exact date, but uh, we were there, I'd say, till early June something like that and uh, it was the, the island was completely taken over by that time and, and you had left for Subic Bay I know there was a tight well we went back to Ulithi first and got reprovisioned then we went into mm -hmm. Subic Bay and I'm not sure what the plan from Subic Bay was but that's where we were in the Philippines and uh, uh, the reason it became a little uh, vague to me at the time is because that's when I received orders to report back to the U.S. to go into flight training. So finally. So finally, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was interesting because there were five, as I mentioned earlier, there were five of us from from my class at the academy and all five of us had requested going back and all it's five of us got orders to go back. <laughs> all five of them that were sleeping in the passageway? Yes. <laughs> But we didn't get they we didn't go back at the same time. We were always just just enough off. But uh, in any event, uh, so as a result, why I uh, I left the ship at Subic Bay probably in uh, well it would have been about mid July I guess something like that, and uh, was in uh, Manila uh, waiting for transportation back to the U.S. And uh, it was interesting from my point of view because uh, Manila had been such a a chaotic, uh, uh, explosive uh, catastrophe in the sense of uh, trying to get the Japs out of Manila and uh, get control of the city, that uh, it was pretty much a shambles. But from my point of view, not having, see, we, were, we didn't see land-based stuff at all to speak of. We were always at sea. So to see uh, the shambles of uh, Manila in, at that stage was obviously very interesting to, to me. And uh, so I was there for perhaps uh, several days waiting for transportation back. And uh, then subsequently got on a troop ship and about the 1st of August and slowly, if you pardon the expression, came back to the U.S. The, the, the quintessential slow boat? <laughs> it was really a slow boat, believe me. <laughs> you were going to go to San Fran, but ended up going to Seattle instead, well, right? Well, it was a troop ship in the sense that they they must have had 2,000 soldiers on it and seven naval officers, and so we were pretty much of a minority. But uh, so uh, it it was it was a loaded ship in that sense. But uh, 
there was nothing, uh, you know, in the way of niceties at all. It was just a case of getting back to the States. But we, we did, we were scheduled to go back in San Francisco and in turn was diverted to Seattle because of the, uh, all the uh, celebrations in San Francisco for uh, the end of the war. And so that, all of the all end of the, the, all of the war activities had occurred? All of the stuff at the end of the war occurred while I was somewhere between <laughs> Manila and Seattle. Did you get news of that? Well, we had, uh, again, a, a ship's... Uh, news sheet in the morning which kind of said what was going on and so yes we knew it what had happened and we knew kind of what was going on but that was it was pretty superficial but it was pretty clear what was going on and uh, from that point on of course where we, we were uh, going to enter the US you know in a after the war status uh, which was great really and uh, so you were warmly welcomed back I think yes, yes. certainly and uh, so uh, it was nice to get back and uh, took a train from Seattle to Chicago and then to Moline where I was going back and uh, it was nice to get home. <laughs> <laughs> then on to flight training. Right. Dallas. I had uh, orders to Dallas and I was, was ordered to be there I think about the 1st of October and I would have been 45 and of course uh, arrived in uh, Dallas accordingly, and uh, went into flying and enjoyed every minute of it. This was your primary? Right. And then advanced was? Primary was in Dallas, and uh, we went on to, I guess you call it advanced, in uh, Corpus Christi, and then in turn we went on to uh, further training in Pensacola. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Dallas we had uh, uh, the significant airplane of the time, which was the a yellow biplane, which was a Stearman, which I, I still love as the greatest airplane that was ever built. But uh, aside from that, then we used uh, flew SNJs, uh, which are a Navy form of uh, training plate, in Corpus, and uh, then in turn went on to Pensacola and was flying PBYs at Pensacola. And at some point, you were going to go to Carrier Qual, but that didn't turn out. Well, I yes, and uh, when we were in Corpus. We uh, got wind that we could uh, the resignations from the naval from the academy or from the uh, navy service were being accepted, and uh, so we we didn't dislike what we were doing, but we kind of some of us thought we could do better in the civilian pursuit than we did in the military pursuit, and uh, so in turn we submitted resignations from the navy, and uh, of course heard absolutely nothing for some time and uh, went on doing the things we were doing and uh, even, you know, finished up at Corpus and went on to Pensacola. After I was at Pensacola and finished up the PBY phase, I was supposed to go on to carry a qualification at Pensacola. And at that point, uh, I got a uh, reaction to my resignation, which had been submitted a year before. And unfortunately, it was a, it declined as a resignation. I couldn't get out. But they gave me orders and took me out of the flight program right away. And uh, that wouldn't have been so bad, except some others got theirs accepted, which kind of annoyed me a little bit. But uh, I subsequently uh, rechecked and resubmitted my resignation another year, and I got out. So, uh, But uh, the, up through that, uh, everything I had was positive, and that was uh, uh, not all that bad. This darn nagging uh, leg. Issue yeah, came back. And you I had the uh, in infection in my ankle again in uh, in uh, Pensacola, and was in the hospital when I they they put me in the hospital so they could treat it. That's when I finished up the PBY flying, and uh, so I was still attached to the hospital when I got the uh, declination on my uh, resignation. So they couldn't I couldn't follow those orders because I was uh, presumably uh, under. Uh, medical care and uh, so I stayed in the hospital for a while and then subsequently since I wasn't getting good treatment there I transferred to a naval facility closer to home which in this case was Great Lakes mm -hmm. so I transferred to the hospital at Great Lakes and they couldn't treat it either but they uh, sent me down to the University of Chicago and they treated me there and it was uh, presumably a fungus uh, dermatitis uh, type fungus and uh, I haven't had any problem with it since, but uh, at the time it was a little annoying. Well, something really big happened in Pensacola, though. 
Oh, that was a big thing in Pensacola. <laughs> so say, uh, tell what that was. Well, I, I met uh, a young lady that was in the uh, American Red Cross there. She was a medical social worker. She had just completed her master's degree at LSU and was assigned to the uh, hospital at uh, uh, Pensacola in the uh, Red Cross program there. And in medical social work, they worked with, uh, obviously, uh, people or servicemen who were in the hospital and being discharged or processed or whatever might be required. And their function was to, to handle whatever needs those servicemen would need and have. And uh, so she was around the hospital, and uh, I watched her for a while and tried to get, get her attention. I almost couldn't get her attention, but eventually I, I did. And uh, so we became engaged for, uh, before we left Pensacola and uh, were married the following August in so, 47. So you left service in July and got married in August. Mm -hmm. And then what? Uh, I went to work for a uh, firm in Beloit, Wisconsin, Fairbanks Morrison Company, as a, an engineer, and uh, worked in a research and development division of Fairbanks Morris operations there. And it was very enlightening because it was a, a large facility. It was uh, about 6,000 employees in that facility. And our, of course, our function on it was a relatively small number, maybe uh, you know, 50 or more people in a research and development function on diesel engines. And uh, these are fairly, these, some of them are fairly large engines. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, is about the size of a house almost. Uh, but uh, I uh, stayed with that for a number of years. I stayed with Fairbanks Morris for about 10 years and then went on to, on to uh, some other positions and somebody did a number of other things and uh, it, that worked out pretty good, greatly. And you had three children along the way? We certainly do. I got three boys and uh, one of them is in uh, Connecticut, one's in New Hampshire and one's them in Colorado. And uh, they're and all a, doing and well. A, and, a, and a slate of uh, grandbabies and oh, great grandchildren. Gran maybe? No, no great grandchildren. No we got some grandchildren. I tried to get all three boys to the Naval Academy, and I couldn't get them near it. <laughs> that was the era when military things were not popular with that generation. Uh, when were your boys born? Uh, well, early fifties. Uh, Fifty. Yeah, same with me. Yeah, yeah. fifty between mean. fifty and yeah. fifty-eight or fifty-nine. So yeah. it, uh, it would have been it was a bad time for yeah. People During going Vietnam, into the military, yep. yeah, and uh, so uh, they uh, they did pretty well. One of them went to uh, Dartmouth, one went to New York University, and one of them started school and wasn't able to finish it directly. So, uh, but uh, they all have done well, and we're delighted. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I take it, I, I think I remember you told me when your boys is coming in for Thanksgiving. Matter of fact, uh, Jim, who lives in Boulder, Colorado, will be in tomorrow for visitors for Thanksgiving, Wonderful. so uh, mm -hmm. we're looking forward to that. And Will he have children with him? Is he your son with children? Or? He has two children, but they're both in Boston, and uh, both of them, actually one of them just finished some graduate work in, uh, oh, in Holland, way grown. <laughs> and the other one was uh, is uh, in her final year at, in college, so they're, they're in uh, Boston, but his wife, it's his second wife, uh, his third wife actually, come to think of it. <laughs> will be with him to visit us mm -hmm. tomorrow. And uh, Paul, have you told your sons or your grandchildren much about World War II? No. Oh, you're kidding. Really? Uh, uh, I think no reason particularly. Uh, it wasn't, uh, since I didn't have any precarious escapes from somebody attacking me or whatever, I, did, did, uh, I don't have the feeling that I can't talk about anything in World War II at all. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, I can talk about any part of it and be comfortable with it. Uh, I just figured the kids just weren't interested. And uh, I, that's why this type of interview, to me, uh, appealed to me right now, because I think that uh, there will come a time, if it's not yet there, that they will be interested in what has transpired. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm delighted to have had this opportunity to... Uh, talk to you and relate some of these experiences. What is your most vivid memory of your service during World War II? I 
I don't feel any particular episode or event sticks in my mind. Uh, I do feel very conscious of both the experience at Iwo Jima in Okinawa in the sense that we took what you might think were dangerous environments and you treated them as it was a regular daily uh, thing that you would do anytime. And uh, since we weren't really all that uh, threatened uh, individually or collectively, uh, it was just an experience. And living with it through those periods uh, gave you kind of a feeling of uh, uh, a small part in a big thing, but a positive part in a big thing. And uh, we felt, I felt, and I think most of us did, that we were doing our part, and of course the net collective result was successful. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me that's something to be proud of, even though my part's pretty small. It seems like we have to debate everything these days. Um, back then, everybody supported World right. War II, is that yeah. correct? Yeah, I'm a little, little concerned currently because I think there's too much debate and too much uh, uh, charge and counter-charge. I think uh, there's an opportunity to be a little bit more collectively responsible for the things and the decisions, but uh, somehow they're not listening to me anymore anyhow, but uh, should they ask, I'd be glad to tell them. And you feel, uh, it sounds like you feel that that support back home uh, made quite a bit of difference? Very much so. And of course, uh, uh, everybody was in it even though they might be on the home front, they were in it. And uh, so everybody had a part in it. And uh, it turned out to be, my experiences, of course, were very enjoyable, enlightening, and interesting, and, and you know, maybe dangerous a little here and there, but not all that dangerous. And so it was more a real positive experience, as far as I'm concerned, in many ways. And uh, happy it developed that way. Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, talks about your generation mm -hmm. and uh, what is it about your generation Paul that you think has captured the imagination of America uh, in the way that it has? Well I think it's that the whole sequence of events at least from my experience uh, including if you pardon the expression the Great Depression of the of the 30s uh, you realized that things could get pretty tight and difficult and that you didn't have the opportunity to flagrantly uh, ignore the responsibilities and patterns of the time. You had to be part of the uh, constructive side rather than the destructive side. So I think uh, that kind of prepared you for it and then most of us uh, in a sense uh, in World War II were involved in World War II one way or another and I think again it was a case of recognizing how important it is to address the real responsibilities and hopefully the real solutions that can help move all of us forward. Um, since then there's a sense, a feeling on my part that there haven't been any tests. In other words everybody has had everything and they could have all they wanted whenever they wanted it and uh, immediate gratification uh, to me is, uh, is, is a bad thing. And yet that seems to be the, the feeling or has been for say a few decades now. And so when it now comes down to the point that uh, I think we're at now where uh, that gratification is no longer a solution, uh, that it's hard for us as a civilization in the United States in particular to grow up to the responsibilities that we have in a constructive way. And uh, so in a sense, uh, when we have to attack uh, every decision as if, uh, you know, you're on your side and I'm, we're on our side and whatever you do is bad and whatever we do is great is not a solution to anything. And so I think this lack of a solution, this ability to stop everything in the interest of making sure that your solution does not get put in place uh, is a destructive thing. And uh, unless we can recognize that as a civilization and as a population, uh, it's going to be hard to walk our way out of this situation that we're in, I think. And I think we're in a difficult situation. I'm not, I'm not uh, I'm old enough, unfortunately, that 
the future is not all that long, but uh, I, I, I concern myself for our kids and our grandkids and that sort of thing. And uh, I'm not optimistic at this point. Well, speaking of kids and grandkids, do you have um, a message for them at the end of this tape? The only message I have is that uh, I think you have a responsibility to be a proper citizen. And uh, if that requires some uh, restrictions on your own flexibility and your own gratification, I think you have to uh, give those things up in the interest of the broader responsibilities that each of us have. And unless you recognize that, and all of us recognize that, uh, the path forward is going to be difficult. That would be my only thought. Paul, it has been a complete delight to meet you. And I've thoroughly enjoyed your story. Uh, on behalf of the Augusta Richmond County Historical Society and the Library of Congress, thank you for your service during World War II, and thank you for allowing me to collect your oral history. Thank you, Jan. This has been, a, I think, an interesting experience for me to go through this and bring back a lot of thoughts that I haven't thought about very much lately, and uh, I appreciate your doing it. I feel that, uh, that, that what you've done is, is certainly uh, helps me in the sense of conveying hopefully to my family maybe what I did or where I was or what I what I was about because I can recall that my dad was in the as I mentioned was in World War One I. I never had the slightest idea what he really did and uh, I would have liked to of course he was died, dead when I was pretty young but in any event I hope this is, might be helpful to my kids I'm sure it will thank you so much This is uh, the bridge of the Tuscaloosa, the heavy cruiser I was on, and uh, I was standing in an officer of the deck watch with another officer which was next to me there. And this happened to be a, uh, when the ship was in Subic Bay in, that would have been in June of 1945. And uh, since we didn't take a lot of pictures in those days on board ship, I was delighted to somehow get this picture. And I'm proud of it, and it, uh, it's the only, about the only picture on the, on the ship that I've got. So uh, I hope it has uh, some value to those who might see it and me in this function.